Welcome everyone, it's Friday the 15th of November, this is the third NB Hot Topics podcast and I am Neil Tucker. The nights are drawing in, the weather has turned foul, it's been wetter than we can imagine over the past couple of weeks, half of the north is underwater, not that you would know it from the media reports, no, you would know that Venice is underwater at the moment, because obviously that takes much greater priority. A few people away on a romantic weekend are having that disrupted by effluent floating past their gondola. Very important. While the people of Doncaster's only form of transport is an inflatable dinghy they bought from Decathlon last year. However, you cannot change the weather, as my gran always says, and we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about what's going on in general practice. So, as usual, we are going to have a quick look at the news. We're going to have a look at some of the latest journals and published research relevant to us in primary care. I'll be joined by Simon Curtis to talk about medical cannabis which has been in the news this week. And then we're going to finish off with an interesting scientific discovery about measles and the immune system. Now, before I forget, as you know, we've only just started doing these podcasts. This is number three. Hopefully there'll be many more, but we do really want your feedback. We've not had a way to do it so far, but what we've done is we've put together a very quick survey to get your opinions about how you think it's going and what you might like to see in in future podcasts. Now, no one likes doing a questionnaire, so we've incentivized it. So if you go to www.nbmedical.com forward slash win, you can enter our competition alongside doing the survey. So the prize is one of our webinars. So that's the online version of one of the NB courses. So that could be the Hot Topics course, the Urgent Care, Diabetes, Cancer, Women's Health, Nursing Update, whatever you like. And you get to watch that in the privacy of your own home whilst getting up to date with some cracking material. So let us know what you think, www.nbmedical.com forward slash win. The closing date is 3pm on Thursday the 28th of November and the winner will be announced on Facebook at 4pm that day. And of course you can carry on the conversation on Twitter as well so come and join us at GP Hot Topics. So what's been in the news most this week? Of course, it's the election. And I've been hearing a lot about a new disease called election fever. I'm not sure that it actually affects members of the population. It might just affect politicians who seem to have developed episodes of mass confabulation. I don't know that there's any cure for this, but if one turns up at your doorstep, make sure you wear a face mark and wash your hands thoroughly afterwards. Now, on the subject of politics, the other big thing in the medical news this week was Matt Hancock, the health secretary, suggesting that the Tories would provide full genome sequencing to every newborn child. Now, we all know that Mr Hancock is a big fan of technology, but you might be thinking what I thought when I saw this first off, and that's that he's really not thought this one through. Even if he hadn't thought it through very well, surely he's watched the film Gattaca and would have realised that there's a lot of ethical issues around sequencing someone's genome without their consent. So it didn't take long for medics to raise their concerns. Would you want your three-year-old to know that they've got Huntington's when they're a kid? Would you want to know that you've got the BRCA gene very early on in life? And that's just the ethics. The science is not even well established. The fact that we can identify a potential genetic marker for a disease doesn't actually translate into a genuine problem developing in the future clearly might lead to a lot of distress. In fact, even Matt Hancock's own justification for it, the fact that he had genetic testing and found that he was at higher risk of having prostate cancer in the future, and he quoted this as a 15% risk by the age of 75 the knowledge of which will make him more likely to attend prostate cancer screening programmes. Now, we all know that by the age of 75, a man's risk of having prostate cancer is realistically higher than 15% anyway, irrespective of your genetic conditions. We also know that there's no screening programme for prostate cancer. Cue mass face palming from medics and civil servants around the country. Now, what about the research in the last couple of weeks? 
We have two interesting trials published involving major multinational corporations. We have some interesting data on chronic dizziness, some on hand arthritis and two new medications which at some point will filter down into use in primary care I'm sure. So first in the BMJ, a paper looking at the effects of calorie menu labelling in a large restaurant franchise in the USA. So they did this randomised control study where in some of these restaurants they put the calories next to the food that people were buying to see if this would have any effect. And the results showed that initially there was a, a, a modest which means pretty small reduction in overall calories consumed by people. But then actually by a year, people, maybe their brains were blocking out the information because they just trended back up to what they were doing anyway. Overall, it doesn't seem a particularly effective strategy. What I really loved about this study is in the methodology, the fast food franchise did not give permission to, to disclose the names of the restaurant chains under a data use agreement. So we don't know which, which fast food chain this actually was. However, there's pictures of KFC all over the website. So I'm not entirely sure if they've just given the game away there or if this is some kind of like covert operation by McDonald's. Who knows? The next study involves Apple. So I remember joking about this on the Hot Topics a couple of years ago when we were talking about new emerging technologies. Now it has come to fruition. So this was a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It involved 420,000 people who downloaded an app which contained an algorithm for their smartwatch to be able to assess for irregular pulse. Over the course of about four months, the algorithm identified 0.5% of the population having an irregular pulse. They were then sent out an ECG patch to give some more detailed information, and that confirmed atrial fibrillation was present in 34% of that group. So clearly, there are elements missing from this study. So we don't know how many people who truly had atrial fibrillation were potentially missed by this app. The majority of the participants were younger, as you would imagine, but it really does show the power of technology to be able to potentially identify problems early and prevent more significant problems happening. Would this paper have been published in the New England Journal of Medicine if it wasn't by Apple? I don't know. But watch this space, we're going to get a lot more of this type of research and we're going to have to find a way of integrating this into our patient care. Now, a study that has more direct relevance to us in primary care was another BMJ paper. And this was looking at patients over the age of 50 with chronic vestibular syndrome. So chronically dizzy, miserable condition, quite difficult for us to meaningfully treat in primary care. So this was a primary care based study conducted in the Netherlands. There was three arms to this trials. So first was usual care, second was standalone rehabilitation, so usual care from the GP plus online sessions of vestibular rehabilitation over the course of six weeks and then blended rehabilitation as the third arm, so usual care from the GP plus online sessions plus face-to-face physiotherapy as well. And what it demonstrated was that there was a significant benefit from doing either the standalone rehabilitation or the blended rehabilitation over usual care. It's an effective tool and there wasn't a lot of difference between the benefits seen with the online vestibular rehabilitation compared with the option that included additional physiotherapy as well. So this looks like a very promising evidence-based way of managing this using very accessible and cheap tools. And I know we've talked about this in the Hot Topics course before. You'll find in the Hot Topics book, we've got links to a very useful UK website on vestibular rehabilitation, which is all completely free. The website has been put together by the University of Southampton that did the initial research, and you can find it at www.balance.lifeguidehealth.org. Org. Then we had an interesting study in The Lancet, and this was a study conducted in the Netherlands in patients who had nasty hand osteoarthritis. And the idea of the study was to look if there was a role for low dose oral prednisolone in trying to manage their symptoms when 
NZ therapies had failed. And they looked at around 90 patients, randomised to either prednisolone 10 milligrams daily for six weeks, followed by short taper, or placebo and they found that there was a significant improvement in pain scores in that prednisolone group with what looks like a a genuinely meaningful clinical real world effect. So this looks like a potential therapeutic option. I'm still not entirely sure about whether I want to subject my patients to 10 milligrams of prednisolone for six weeks, although the paper did comment it appears to be a safe option with very few adverse effects. Nevertheless, it's a short-term study. They're not looking at longer-term risks here. But it may be welcome in our patients who are really, really struggling that now there appears to be an evidence-based alternative. There were two interesting papers in JAMA in the last couple of weeks as well, both of which it's fair to say it's going to be a little while before we see them translating into general practice. One was looking at a new drug for cholesterol modification. The second was looking at a new antibiotic for pneumonia. So the first study was looking at a drug called bempedoic acid and they compared this to placebo when adding it in to people who were on maximally tolerated statins in a patient group who were at high cardiovascular risk. And this bempedoic acid led to a substantial reduction in people's cholesterol levels. The study is an exploratory study, so they're not looking at end outcomes, but with a decent lowering of someone's LDL, it's generally considered that that will translate into fewer heart attacks, etc. Time will tell, but I think it's quite welcome because this seems like a fairly safe and well-tolerated drug. And although there's no mention about the price, it's going to be substantially less expensive than the other new sexy option for cholesterol management, the PCSK9 monoclonal antibodies. So we haven't seen a lot of those. They have been licensed and recommended for use within the UK. But as with so many of these biological therapies, they are obscenely expensive, thousands and thousands of pounds. They're beyond the reach of most health services. So whilst it's exciting that these options can exist until they make them more cost effective, they're definitely not going to be a good option. So you never know, watch this space, bempedoic acid could be the next big thing. The second study is looking at a new antibiotic called lefamulin. They were using this to treat community-acquired bacterial pneumonia. So this was a randomised controlled trial. They had 740 or so participants, half of them randomised to lefamulin and the other half to moxifloxacin. And they found that at four days, both groups had a 91% response rate. So it demonstrated non-inferiority of lefumulin. Now, it does beg some questions. It's very, very welcome that we might have a new antibiotic option on the horizon. But why on earth were they comparing it to moxifloxacin? Why not just have a look at how good it was compared with amoxicillin? What's going to be the price? Well, in fact, the price is $275 per day of oral treatment, which most of us would consider quite pricey. And it has twice the rate of diarrhea side effects than the quinolones. So it's welcome that there's a new option on the horizon, but it's definitely not a perfect option. And we should probably stick to our normal antibiotics first. Right, next, we are joined by Simon Curtis. So many of you will know Simon from the Hot Topics course. He's the founder, set the course up 21 years ago. 21 years ago. 21 years ago. That was... um, Wait a minute. Was I even in medical school then? Were you even born? Let's let's. Were you even were you even a twinkle in your mother's eye? And so uh, we are going to talk about probably the hottest topic of the week, which has been medical cannabis. But first, I think you've had a you've had a busy couple of weeks, haven't you, Simon? Tell me where you've been. I've just been to South Africa, Neil. Can you not spot from my little bit of a tan? No. <laughs> no, you must you must be very good with the sun cream. Yeah, what were you doing in South Africa? Yeah, so this was our first ever Hot Topics course in South Africa. It's quite an exciting project that's been set up by this very inspirational South African GP called Samantha Fee. And Sam has set up this organisation called GP First to really try to bring primary care and general practice into the forefront of South African healthcare. And it's called GP First because trying to encourage medical students and young doctors in South Africa to go into general practice first 
rather than falling into it, but also to try to create a system whereby patients naturally go to see their GP first before specialists. And I met lots of very inspirational doctors there, sort of doctors that may you feel very inadequate, both as a doctor <laughs> and a human being. I met this one guy who, you know, who's near, who works as a GP and close to the Botswana border. And his nearest hospital is 250 miles away. We were talking about heart failure and he was explaining how he'd got a portable echo machine in his <laughs> office. <laughs> So he uh, did his own echoes on patients as well. And we met a huge range of doctors, including doctors working incredibly difficult situations and positions in the in the townships in South Africa. There's this huge contrast between first world medicine and developing world medicine. So it was uh, it was a really yeah it was really exciting experience. I was mindful that you mentioned that even there in a completely different medical system, that there seems to be the same problems that GPs face so they're Absolutely. you know they're struggling they have difficulties with burnout yeah and I, I think it's fascinating issue. this is something that's not just UK this is something that's yeah. it's everywhere everyone whatever because the potential of general practice is infinite wherever you work whether it's you're working in a private setting or a public setting you're always constrained by resources and this ever increasing patient demand and expectation and hope means that you're you're never going to be able to deliver as much as is wanted from you or as if you'd potentially be able to. And that that is true across all different health systems. Okay, well, let's move on to medical cannabis. So this has been a huge issue in the news over the last couple of weeks. I was amazed to see that since the law has changed, which had relaxed some of the restrictions on cannabis for medical use a year ago now, apparently only 10 people in the country have been prescribed medical cannabis, which is quite incredible. I was really surprised by it. But perhaps it's not a surprise because then this week we've had a new NICE guideline publish. Uh, I'll let you talk about that in a second. And we've got a couple of other studies to have a, have a quick look at as well. Maybe do you want to start off with the NICE guideline? What is this recommended about use of medical cannabis? Their recommendations are pretty restrictive, as everyone was expecting, but actually they're slightly less restrictive than the draft guideline, which only made a recommendation for nabilone as a cannabis-based product, which for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, which of course we've had for years. In the final guideline, they have made a positive recommendation for nabilone. They've also made a positive uh, recommendation for another treatment that's been around for years, Sativex, for treatment of spasticity and multiple sclerosis. This is an oral mucosal spray that's got a mix of cannabidiol and also THC, the more psychoactive component uh, of, of cannabis as well. The controversial area with medical cannabis is, of course, with epilepsy, particularly treatment-resistant epilepsy, particularly these terrible, rare childhood epilepsy syndromes like Lennox, Gestau and, and Dravet syndrome. And for those particular syndromes, there's actually going to be a separate NICE technology appraisal, which is coming out next month. But the expectation is that this new drug called Epidiolex, which is a highly concentrated form of cannabidiol, will be recommended. The NICE guideline this week for severe treatment-resistant ep epilepsy fell short of making a positive recommendation for treatment, but also they did not recommend against its use by specialist doctors in, in treatment-resistant cases, which sort of gives the green light for, for specialists to use it in these very, very difficult, very, very difficult cases. So positive news and negative news, really, for these groups of patients. But the biggest group of patients that have an interest in yeah. cannabis use, of course, is those who have chronic pain. Yeah. And this is perhaps from the general practice perspective, where we might have most interest in yeah. cannabis as a potential medical device, because... We've got so many people who have chronic pain. We have limited options. We have an yeah. increasing amount of data that show the options that we've got aren't very good. And I think people were hoping that there might be some recommendation, a 
positive recommendation for the use of medical cannabis for chronic pain. But that's not what NICE have done, is it? Yeah, no. So NICE have made a very explicit recommendation that no cannabis-based product should be recommended for chronic pain pending further research. And this has been a very, very controversial recommendation. Been a number of unintended consequences from the law change a, a year ago. One of them is, has been a big increase in hope and expectation for patients with chronic pain, also with other chronic neurological dis- diseases. But also, I think it's very interestingly, there's been a sort of change in the way that people think about cannabis from thinking about it as a recreational drug to a potential medical treatment which I've seen in a number of patients, has actually started to sort of legitimise illicit use. And um, as I mentioned in the blog that I published yesterday, I've had a couple of patients that have actually started smoking cannabis, have taken it up to try to treat their chronic pain and their uh, their other chronic conditions. And whilst only 10 patients in the country have been prescribed on the NHS, every GP in the country has been asked about it by, um, by patients. So in terms of the evidence base for chronic pain, there have been two recent systematic reviews published in the last year, one looking at neuropathic pain in Cochrane a year ago, another one published in the imaginatively titled journal Pain uh, in the last year, uh, looking at placebo-controlled trials. And both of them have had pretty negative outcomes. The problem with these systematic reviews, though, is The answers that you get out are only as good as the data that you feed in. And most of the studies are small, they're of poor quality, and they're very heterogeneous because cannabis obviously contains hundreds of different components. And they're looking at very small, generally low quality trials, often with different components and shoving them all into a systematic review and coming out with a a fairly negative finding at the end of it. And that has created quite a lot of anger amongst uh, certain communities of patients, patient groups. Um, For example, I was reading yesterday about patients with multiple sclerosis. Yes, um, they have now approval for Satavex for spasticity, but a lot of patients with multiple sclerosis have got chronic pain. And recent research shows that 25% of them are, are using cannabis illicitly to try to control those pain Mm. symptoms. So NICE have said quite explicitly it should not be prescribed, recommended or used for chronic pain pending further research. And those trials are ongoing. There is, I think, genuine hope that there may be some positive outcomes from them. But I think the, the lessons that we've learned from the opioid crisis and the problems that we're seeing at the moment with the opioid crisis, particularly in the state, should really mean that we do exercise caution before running ahead and making lots of recommendations uh, ahead of a sound evidence base to support. Easy to say that about us as clinician. People are already voting with their feet, aren't they, yeah, as you've yeah. already described. It's interesting to look at the differences between cannabis products. And whilst we can't really go into a huge amount of detail on this podcast, there's a large amount of debate around the different types of cannabis products that are being used because a lot of the uh, medications that are generated are containing THC, some are containing um, CBD, so cannabidiol. But there's another interesting debate that says actually to get some of the therapeutic benefits out of cannabis that we might expect, you actually need a mixture that you get in the plant itself of thousands of different uh, chemical products and actually trying to separate it out into some specific just chemical compounds actually there's a feeling that's unlikely to produce satisfactory benefits that people might experience so welcome that in the news this week i see that there is now a uk registry for cannabis-based trials that's opened up this is a charity organization which is trying to encourage and drive further good quality research in this area, which I think is going to be really, really welcome. One of the big things that's quoted is this concern about dependency. Dependency rates are up to something like almost 10%. A lot of patients who are habitual users, particularly on sort of types of of weed that are often, often, often used now, like skunk, for example, which has got very, very high proportion of THC. Personally, I, I believe that. Certainly, I have some patients and it's been a real struggle getting off it. 
you know, I, I struggle to believe that in some ways, because I think that that may be true for some habitual users. That may be true if you're using a product that contains high levels of THC. But I'm also mindful about in the general population, experimentation with cannabis at some point yeah. is, is extremely common. Uh, but the majority of us are not dependent on it. Yeah, so no, I just... But it wasn't skunk. No. Very, very high level of THC. There is a difference. Again, that just illustrates how confusing a sort of product it is because, I mean, it's it, it means many, many different things to many, many different different people. Yeah. Going to, to Holland and Barrett and buy, you, you sort, of, buy sort, CBD sort, of, sort of CBD oil. You know, and uh, know lots of people that are doing that, thinking yeah. that they're sort of having cannabis and in fact i looked on the holland and barrett i looked on the holland and barrett website this morning uh, at, we're not sponsored by no, no, no. i'm sure there's lots of other places you can get it out there but i, I looked on the holland and barrett website this morning and i thought it was interesting just to see the reviews from users when you look at the sort of the whole sort of collection of options that they've got actually it 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 doesn't score that well in terms of no. overall benefit for people no. so you know, we're talking sort of three or four stars in the context of websites where you do reviews these days. That's, that would be considered pretty poor, wouldn't it? <laughs> so maybe that does show that in the context, and a lot of people there were using it for pain. Maybe but, overall it doesn't work that but, well. But again, this has been another unintended consequence of the law change, that it's not just raised hope and expectation, but it's just changed the way that we, we, we view these products. Uh, it's worth just pointing out, actually, that the options that Knight have recommended are specialist prescription only. So we're not going to be initiating them in primary care anytime soon. But Knight also does talk about shared care protocols. So we may be continuing on with yeah. prescribing once the shared care protocols are in place. Particularly for navalone and satellite. So, I think, so, you know, MS, chemotherapy induced, nausea, vomiting, these are patients that you know, we see reasonably regularly yeah. and possibly in these severe cases of treatment resistant epilepsy. Um, I was uh, talking last week to in, uh, here in Oxford with uh, the head of our specialist pain clinic uh, uh, here in Oxford, and she she was saying they're just getting loads of requests from patients. But anyway, they've they've had to for their poor receptionist, they've had to write out a pro forma about <laughs> what to say to people when they ring up and ask about if they're prescribing medical cannabis. And of course, the answer to that is no, unless it's unless it's part of a part of an ongoing trial. All right. Well, thank you very much, Simon. That's been really, really interesting. And I guess watch this space. We're going to see more research in this area, aren't we? If you're interested in medical cannabis, can I make a small plug? Of course. Uh, for on uh, December the third, we've got a free hot topics clinic webinar that I'm doing. One of these clinics where we have three random patients that come in to see us and one of those patients is coming in asking for medical cannabis for his chronic pain so we'll be talking in a little bit more detail than we have now around the evidence base um, for cannabis and chronic pain. And finally scientists have made an interesting discovery about the effects that measles have on the body. So measles that's bad news that's not new news but what I wasn't aware of was that after measles, your risk of dying from an unassociated infection increases substantially. So there are 100,000 deaths worldwide per year from measles. But then two or three times that amount will die from an infection as a result of the effect that measles has on the immunity and what it seems to do is it seems to wipe out our immune memory and so these deaths are happening from common infections which most of us would have developed some kind of immune response to over the course of our lifetime but that protection goes and so um, people particularly children are at much higher risk if ever there was a case for ensuring vaccination of children for measles this is definitely it now, of course, I know that I'm preaching to the converted, but it, perhaps it puts another string in our bow if we're trying to convince that person who's hard to convince. So that's it for today. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast. Depending on how you're listening to this, please subscribe. We will be back in two weeks. Don't forget, please do give your opinions on the podcast. So go to mbmedical.com forward slash win to be in with a chance of winning that webinar. Find us on Twitter at GP Hot Topics and have a fantastic weekend. Take care, everyone. Bye bye.